gather on your word. Pray that these words in my mouth and these meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, our strength.
turn the tables of the status quo, so they look to Jesus. They look to the poor man of Nazareth with his robes dragging on the ground, and they declare that he is their king. We have this, we have this sense now that maybe it wasn't all that right. Maybe the little children casting branches and people, the ragged people in the streets casting their garments on the floor, just wasn't all that grand. And yet Jesus allows this scene. By the way, in my notes I have written over this topic, Palm Sunday, the Sabbath. You see, Jesus very much engenders this scene. Jesus creates this scene. If you can make no mistake about it, Jesus goes ahead and he asks his disciples, go find me a horse. No, go find me a colt. Go find me a baby donkey so I can ride on it. And when people ask you, and they will, what are you doing with that thing? Just tell them the Lord needs it. But the question is, well, why does Jesus do this? It's clearly not an accident. It clearly isn't that Jesus was tired, there weren't any more taxis around. Jesus specifically asks for this. The Lord has needed it. And uh, people have argued over this. And, and here's my thought for you. I would like to suggest to you that today we have an example of Jesus at his subversive best. This is Jesus at his absolutely subversive best. Jesus is not the first one who had his entry into a city described as a triumphal entry. In fact, there were hundreds if not thousands of conquerors before Jesus and hundreds if not thousands afterwards who made triumphal entries into cities. By the way, there are two kinds of tribal countries. There's the kind you make when you're going into the conquered people. The kind you, you, you make when you're about to take siege of something. And, and then there's the kind you make when you're coming into your hometown to receive your laurels, your medals, and with the key to the city. The desperate, disillusioned populace looking for a champion looking for someone to turn the tables on Rome, looking for someone to put their oppressors down, looking for someone to say, hey, why can't we do a little pressing for a change? When do we get to be the one who says? Jesus comes to the city, and he lays siege to Jerusalem, but not with swords, not with guns, not with cannons, not with armies and horses. <clears throat> Jesus comes into the city and he marches right to the temple. Jesus comes into the city and he takes his little band of children, ragged followers, and they go right to the city. You can read it, you can check it out. It's right there. They go. Look at what it says. They go to the temple. They go to the temple courts. He looks around at everything. And then he goes home. Well, he goes to someone else's home. He goes to Bethany, the twelve. If you were to follow Mark's narrative, you would discover that one of the next major events is Jesus going into the temple and turning over the tables. You see, Jesus did come to turn the tables on the oppressors. Jesus did come to lay siege. Jesus did come to conquer. Jesus indeed conquers, but he conquers.
conquers violence. He conquers hatred. He conquers prejudice. And he does so not with a sword, not with a gun, not with an army, not even with a fist. The most powerful weapon of all, the weapon of unconditional love. You have a Bible, go ahead and take it out. If not, it'll be quick. You just feel you'll get the idea. I just want to go through a couple of things that Jesus did. You know, there, there are some weeks that I get to the end of the week and I say, oh my gosh, what a week. Oh, I've had an incredible week and I wrote my laundry list of things that I've done. And a lot of those things involve a stack of books and some of those things involve a stack of sheet music and some of those things involve a whole lot of sawdust and wood stain. But I say, what a week. I wonder what Jesus would have said. So he starts off, I mean, he comes into town, he's riding on a donkey. He gets into town, people call him the king. Blessed, verse 10, verse 10 of chapter 11. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. He decides to go to church. But it's late, there's nobody there. He looks around and starts making plans. The next day, verse 12, the next day he goes to Bethany. Jesus has an argument with the fig tree. Well, he does. He meets this fig tree. He knows the figs are out of season. He looks anyway. He says to the fig tree, I can't have any of you. Nobody else will either. Fig tree withers. The next thing, I guess Jesus was having a bad day that day. The next thing he does is he, he cleanses the temple. He separates economy from religion. Then they question his authority. How are you doing this? Then he tells some parables. Then he has an economic discussion about taxes. Then they question about the theology of marriage. By the way, I'm now uh, chapter 12, verse 18. He runs into the Sadducees. Then he talks about the greatest commandments. Then they ask him about his parentage. Then he talks about the signs of the end of the age. He predicts Peter's denial. And finally, after celebrating Passover with his friends, he is betrayed and arrested. What a week. Have you ever felt betrayed? Has anyone ever betrayed you? Have you ever betrayed anyone? Jesus was betrayed. He was betrayed by the crowds who shouted the song. He was betrayed by his best friends. And I wonder why. Come full circle. How do we get from Hosanna to crucify him? Remember being in grade school? Remember how at recess it shoots up teams? It happened almost every year. It happened almost every year whenever I would start a new class and be in with a new group of kids. And it was time to, it was time to choose up teams. You see, I was tall. There's something about the, the zeitgeist of the culture that suggests that tall people are athletic. Tall people are strong. Tall people have physical prowess. You know what the problem with that is? In my case, nothing could have been more false. Nothing could have been farther from the truth. You see, then and now, self-admittedly, I was a geek. I liked nothing better than to find myself a big stack of books or maybe just some pencils and some white paper. I'm really happy. I can read. I can do math problems. That's when I was happy. Keep away. Soccer. Kickball. Not really. But I'm presented. Or maybe out of sheer desperation to find someone who would tip the odds to our team, everybody wanted to talk it. And I knew how this was going to go. But no, 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 no. I got chosen to be a pitcher. I can't even throw in a straight line. I got chosen to be a catcher. And when I got chosen to be a first baseman, I actually stayed out on the field for two innings and I didn't even know which one was my team. I was so bad. <laughs> you know what the result of that is? Was the result of that was the kids really hated me after a while? Well, maybe 
maybe hate is too strong a word, but it's a word that kids use a lot. I said, oh, I hate you! And as you get a little older, sometimes just follow my stuff. That's all kinds of that's. And the reason really wasn't anything personal. I just wanted I was disappointed. They expected me to be one thing. They expected me to be the champion of the schoolyard. Instead of a geek. Well, I never told them I was going to be the champion of the school in the schoolyard. I never told them I was the best first baseman ever. In fact, I told them by the contrary. I told them exactly what I was about. But they didn't hear it. They wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. Well, that's a silly story. You understand what I'm going. You see, people then saw what Jesus was about. They saw that there was no malice in him. They saw that there was no hatred in him. They saw that he said over and over again in word and in deed, my kingdom is not of this earth. And yet in their desperation, they said, you will be our king. In their desperation, they said, you will will usher in the new kingdom like unto that of David the warrior. And he displayed them. Sorely and completely. I suppose I could ask if Jesus disappoints us today. When we look at the condition of the world and we say, God, why do you allow this to happen? Why do you make this world this way? Why do you allow, and here you can feel the like, why don't you do something about this? Why don't you punish them the way they deserve? Does Jesus disappoint us? I suppose the disappointment ran both ways. We'll read in a few moments how Jesus speaks to the pronouncement that they will all fall away. The cowardice in their desire for violence, in their disappointment, they will all fall away. And each in turn says, oh, not hot. Even Peter makes the proclamation, but they all fall away. I will die of you. Was Jesus disappointed? Was Jesus disappointed in the people whom he had healed? Was Jesus disappointed in the people to whom he had preached love? And still, they saw violence. My question to you now is, How will we react when we disappoint someone? When we disappoint someone? Or when someone disappoints us? Jesus hung, dying on the cross, disappointed with humanity. A humanity that was disappointed with him. Hanging and dying on the cross, he continued to speak words of peace. Praise be to God, the resurrection. The first words of the 